Welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online summit exploring pathways towards more healthy and regenerative cultures. Uh, I'm Eva Schoenfeld and I'm here with my very dear friend Claire Mill. Mm. Um, welcome Claire and thanks so much for spending time with us mm. on this. Um, I'm going to hand over to you to do a little introduction, a little bit of background, your kind of, your kind of bio. What, what's, what have you been up to in your life? <laughs> thanks. Um, thank you and thanks for inviting me here. Um, um, well, I guess, yeah, what kind of leads me, the breadcrumbs that kind of bring me to this point in my life um, are... Um, I've been working in social environmental change for over 20 years now. And that started off in kind of campaigning NGOs um, in London, all around global social, global social justice. Um, and then I got very into um, local food. So I was working in various capacities around relocalizing our food system, um, including working for Bristol uh, City Council and um, helping to found Transition Bristol. Um, so I was very involved with transition from uh, right at the beginning um, and um, and also the No Tesco and Stokes Croft campaign, which some people might be familiar with. Um, I was coordinating that. So, yeah, I went from kind of global social justice to um, to really focusing much more on the kind of grassroots and how do we relocalize, relocalize our food system, all of which involved being involved in groups and organizations in various capacities. Um, and then, I mean, I gradually began, began to realize just how burnt out I was. Um, and that really um, catalyzed quite a deep inner journey. Um, and actually, even though the kind of catalyst for it was specifically around burnout, it did really then connect me with how conflict related to that and how actually the same underlying kind of uh, issues within myself were, and within our culture and society were kind of leading to burnout and conflict. It wasn't, they weren't separate. Um, and so, yeah, that just catalyzed me on a really rich and transformative and, and rewarding kind of inner journey um, and uncomfortable at times um, <laughs> a journey that, that, yeah, that kind of leads me to being here now. And I, you know, uh, for a few years before, um, up until relatively recently, I was working for Transition Network um, as their inner transition coordinator. Um, so yeah, I had a very particular lens on looking at how conflict was showing up within the transition movement and within transition network itself. And that, that kind of put even more of a kind of microscope in a way on, on how conflict shows up and um, our relative capacities to respond to that. And um, yeah, so that's up until relatively recently. And now I have the pleasure of working with you <laughs> um, on a project, a new initiative that we're obviously working on called Starter Culture which is, very, is all about putting this kind of inner dimension of change, which we could call inner transition, um, back at the kind of epicenter um, of life. Um, and that's, that's what I'm hoping we'll get to talk about today is like, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean to put the inner dimension of our life back in um, the epicenter? What does radical inner led change kind of really mean? Um, and how does that relate to conflict? So these, these are questions that really fascinate me. And I feel like I'm in a very rich journey myself and have a lot of humility around <laughs> around um yeah my growing capacity around conflict but still you know plenty of way to go yeah thank you thanks very much um how does your how does your journey with conflict start i mean mm. you know what, what's what's what was your pathway through mm. um, you know the kind of way that it it you were taught to deal with it in your family and in mm -hmm. kind of wider culture. And then, you know, you're, you're developing your own mm. kind of analysis of it. How, how did all those, that kind of unfold? Mm, great question. Um, well, I'd kind of say that up until um, maybe say eight or nine years ago, I didn't really have a clue about conflict and, and it kind of was almost, it didn't, it, it didn't exist in my consciousness. So, um, I don't believe it's ever not there. It's almost like it, you know, it's just to what degree is it showing itself? Um, and I don't mean that in the kind of big explosive version of conflict. I kind of mean the kind of the sub more subterranean versions of conflict, which is, you know, when we're sort of not paying attention to it and pushing it away. So, yeah, it, it's almost like it, it, it in my family, it would show up in kind of an explosiveness. 
Um, um, and then I'd say that really in, in my school, school years and, and even in um, the kind of majority of my working experience and working in groups, up until about 10 years ago, um, it just didn't really get a look in. It was almost like it, there wasn't space. And, and I feel like that's partly to do with the times. I feel like there is so much more awareness now. And I feel like, you know, we as a kind of species are becoming more and more ready um, to be able to heal the parts of us that kind of um, need healing and that relate to kind of sh conflict showing up. So I feel like the kind of increase um, that we're seeing in conflict showing up is actually because we're more ready. And when I look back at my history at work, it just, well, actually what I see, and I was reflecting on this just before we started uh, chatting, uh, what I see is that um, prior to becoming aware of um, conflict in my relationships in my groups, um, I just had a very combative way of relating. And it, it was like it was so normal, both in me and in the relationships I was in. It was almost like this kind of slightly sort of um, wrangling. There was a kind of like it was just accepted. And on, one, on the one hand, I kind of am like, want to celebrate that and be like oh great because it's not pushing it underground it's almost like oh the conflict's kind of more in the open i'm thinking here of kind of working in ngos campaigning ngos um and then when i think about it i'm like yeah but the thing is is that that more combative um cultural norm it just replicates the status quo it's like those that feel like more empowered and more able and, and are more identified with an idea that they're right. <laughs> and I was so in that camp for a very long time. It was so conditioned from such a young age to kind of just believe that I was right. Um, and, you know, so I would come in too, unconsciously, I would come into relationship with whether it was a friend or a colleague, and there would be an assumption that I was right. And, and I, and my experience kind of, and, and my inquiry around this show, sort of is pointing to the fact that, and then there's a whole other camp of people <laughs> who they've had the opposite conditioning and, um, they're on the other side of the coin in a way of patriarchy and they've been conditioned, um, to believe they're wrong. Um, and there are layers because when I get underneath, I believe I'm wrong too. <laughs> Just depends what layer of me is kind of coming into relationship. And so, yeah, there was a kind of like just a realizing that, oh, yeah, of course, if we just let kind of this combative um, way of relating kind of be the norm, then it just perpetuates this what I see as a patriarchal pattern around who's got power and who doesn't, what parts of our culture are kind of seen as more powerful and given more power. Um, and, and yeah, so, yeah, for me, there's been a, a huge journey um, that yeah as a result of kind of various sort of um things that happened that kind of catalyzed um me going into this deep inner inquiry of realizing that i really needed to inquire into how i relate and how i am part of um this kind of um yeah patriarchal way of being and just recognizing that in bringing myself in a way that that seemed very empowered and you know fearless um it was almost like there was a kind of like unconscious assumption that it's not problematic because nobody would tell me it was problematic. I would never get any feedback from anyone that that, that dynamic was going on. And it took some really painful um, interactions and some really brave friends to give me feedback. And, and you know, and, and I wasn't very graceful initially. <laughs> um, I found that really, really hard to hear. It was, it, it catalyzed trauma in my system. Like it was like it, the reality is, is that, that that had been so suppressed and in the kind of paradoxical way that these things happen, nobody had given me the feedback. So I'd been living in kind of fantasy land. And, um, and then it took, you know, a number of years to really sort of be working around cleaning that out and realizing that the key was learning to feel my vulnerability and that this seemingly kind of um, empowered, um, fearless way of relating um, that was very identified unconsciously with being right um, was actually a massive protective mechanism for, to not feel my fear and vulnerability, which it turned out was epic. <laughs> turned out there was a whole lot of that to feel and you know and and it's been a long old journey to really get to a point now where you know i'm i have a really strong capacity to to feel vulnerable vulnerability and fear in my system and the sensations that accompany that 
um, and the nervous system state of kind of fight or fl flight or freeze in extreme situations. You know, I've really, really over a number of years worked my muscle to be able to tolerate that and hold myself in it so that I can show up in relationship with that vulnerability um, without asking someone else to fix me or take care of that vulnerability, but including it. And I feel like it's probably worth me pausing because there's a lot here. Um, but let's just sort of leave it for this question of like, for me, the, the, the kind of starting point to being able to navigate um, conflict in a healthy, transformative way is really learning how to, in a very kind of um, sensate, visceral way, to um, hold ourselves in our vulnerability. Wow, great. Yeah, what a journey. Mm -hmm. um, and you were talking about how that journey helped you to develop a kind of much clearer sense and a kind of lens to mm -hmm. use when you're looking at what goes on between people in groups. Um, and I wonder if you could sort of unpack that a little bit. Mm. Mm. So I guess my experience in groups is that um, we've all got our kind of history with um, conflict. Um, and unless we have been kind of doing quite a lot of inner work, um, the chances are there's going to be kind of unresolved kind of stuff within us in relationship to conflict. I mean, unless we were really, really lucky and um, our parents had a really healthy relationship with conflict, then we're going to have, have learned, um, you know, strategies, survival strategies that when we were very young were necessary to protect us um, from the kind of less healthy conflict that was playing out. So in groups, um, I think the starting point is recognizing that is, you know, for us all to really recognize that, you know, those of us that are kind of converse and healthy in conflict are kind of rare, you know, and that that's just where we're at as a species um, at the moment. Um, and so I think the starting point really is recognizing that, in my opinion, um, we're not going to bring about a healthy culture around conflict um, unless we recognize that that inner work needs to happen. And it doesn't matter how many sort of systems you put in place. Um, that's not going to happen, you know, and, and the systems are really important. It's not that they're not important because they create the container and the conditions that make it more or less easy for us to fill that vulnerability um, as a starting point. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in terms of groups, I feel like um, we are seeing more conflict arising. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, it, asking ourselves the question of um you know what is my relationship with conflict um how do i feel about conflict and i guess for me um our capacity to be in conflict healthily is in direct correlation with the degree to which we have what i call wholeness in our system so the degree to which we're kind of liberated really and able to really show up in our fullness it's like if we repress our rage, if we have a judgment, which many of us in the social environmental movement do, not all, but many have a judgment that, you know, anger um, is, is bad and wrong and not welcome, um, then, then that's gonna show up in, you know, if we're repressing it, it's gonna leak out and it's gonna come, come into our groups and relationships in other ways. Um, you know, and there's so much of us, so much of ourselves that we kind of make wrong and we, we push away and we repress. And for sure, that is just, that is exactly what conflict thrives on. So the more of you that you can um, be aware of and kind of include in relationship in a healthy way, in, a, in an awake way, you could say, in a way that's kind of aware of it with presence, rather than it being repressed and in shadow, and therefore it's leaking out or exploding out without us really being in control of that, um, then the healthier the kind of dynamics going to be to move. Um, whereas in my experience, um, I and, and others that I've seen in conflict, we get really stuck because it's almost like we've got this, A, our nervous system contracts, and then B, we've got kind of, we've, we've created a story that only gives us a very limited kind of um, number of options of how we can behave right now. And so for a long time, when I was going through my journey around um, um, relearning how to feel vulnerable, 
um, I, without realizing it, I threw, I threw my kind of rage and my empowerment out the window. It was almost like, oh, all I can do here is be vulnerable. And because I was still learning, I would just go into kind of a real victim place. And it was almost like I, I didn't see any other option other than being vulnerable. And, and that just kind of um, freezes the field because if I'm being vulnerable and I'm only willing to be vulnerable, then it immediately puts the other person into the position of being uh, the persecutor and the oppressor. And you've got this kind of conflict then. Whereas if I'm in my wholeness and I'm, I'm kind of being true with whatever I'm experiencing, the chances are I'm going to be flipping between vulnerability and rage and, and many, you know, other things. But it's when we get kind of fixed on an idea that we're only allowed to be a certain way to be loved, to be accepted, then I think that's where we get stuck in conflict because it sets us up. So like, if I say that, I, some, you know, if I go into a victim place, then I immediately make somebody else into the oppressor. If I go into kind of more of an oppressive way only, um, and I, I'm not in touch with my vulnerability, then I am gonna kind of put that other person into a victim place because there's not fluidity. So yeah, I mean, gosh, there's so much more to say about groups, but for me, that. That, that's what I see happen is that we get ourselves stuck in this kind of like polarity in a way um, because we, you know, very few of us are uh, really in touch with the kind of the wholeness of what it is to be alive. And we've got these kind of narrow ideas of what is okay and what's, um, yeah, what will get us accepted um, and loved in that way. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's deep stuff, isn't it? And, and, and quite countercultural in lots of ways. Mm. I mean, that's a lot of what, mm. what we've been looking at in mm. starter culture is, yeah. is how do you transform culture? And, and I guess that's the question I've got for you just now mm. is, you know, given that um, transition groups in particular, you know, any, any activist groups really, they're drawn from just a, a, a ragtag bunch of people mm. who've happened to show up, mm. who are coming into this group for a range of different, mm. you know, very honourable reasons, mm. the really, you know, a whole range of different backgrounds and a very different levels of self-awareness mm. um, and ability around this stuff. So, you know, if you kind of show up at your first meeting or, you know, at your 20th meeting mm. with this group of, of collaborators, how do you address the fact that, that, you know, some people may have done quite a lot of work along the lines that you're mm. suggesting and other people really haven't and yet mm. you've kind of got a job to do together mm. Mm. so how do we how do mm. we kind of navigate that mm. you know, the different levels of of mm. awareness the different places we are or mm. are on our, on our journeys yeah sure it's great great and really important question um i mean i think partly um this kind of brings us to the lens of um self-responsibility and it's you know it's like um for those of us that are um kind of um aware of the role that inner work plays in self-reflection and taking responsibility for our um, what we're bringing to the table. Well, let's just really get behind that, you know, because at the end of the day, we can't change how other people live. It's just a reality. And no matter how much many of us <laughs> would love to be able to change other people, it's how we, you know, relate with how we bring ourselves into relationship that is the bit that we can kind of control and change. So what I'm constantly inviting myself to do to varying degrees of success is to keep bringing it back to myself, you know? And so when, you know, I find myself in a group where, like you say, there's a varying degree of awareness and capacity around this. It's like, it's so easy for me to kind of just latch onto that and make other people wrong and to kind of, you know, be like, Oh, well, oh, I just want, I want, I want there to be more awareness. I want, you know, whatever. And it's like, yeah, but there isn't. So, what can you do? Like, what are you bringing to this? Like, what are you choosing? Like what, you know, and it's, it's, so for me, my tools, I guess, in that, and what I would offer to anyone that's kind of feeling that dynamic, and it is this kind of process around, um, well, the first step is around differentiation and recognizing that when conflict comes in to, to the field, it's like we tend to entangle and we tend to kind of just get really entangled and we lose our capacity to kind of respond, to differentiate and respond and kind of really connect with what's going on in me, what are my needs? And we tend to kind of just get into a reaction to, to this entangled reaction to, because we're triggered, we're activated. So for me, in these kind of mixed levels, you know, mi mixed levels of awareness groups, it's like, oh, well, for a start, I need to like 
call myself into presence and, and check when I'm being activated and triggered and reactive and, and really kind of create that differentiation so that I kind of energetically, I'm like, oh, okay. So there's, there's beautiful Eva <laughs> and beautiful Eva has this perspective and, oh, that's activated something in me. I can feel that in my system. And there's a wanting to do something to defend to whatever. And, oh, I'm really up in my head and, you know, all of these things that I can notice. I'm then just really dropping into, okay, so when I let that all settle, like, what is there? Like, what do I need right now? Like, what is going on for me? Um, you know, is there vulnerability? Is there rage? Um, and what are my needs? You know, and I think that those three questions, like, you know, am I feeling vulnerable? Am I feeling angry? And what are my needs? Um, and how can I meet them in healthy ways? This is what I would just invite, you know, everyone to be kind of doing constantly in relationship um, to just keep asking those questions and to really get to know what vulnerability feels like in your system and to grow the muscle to tolerate it. And the same with rage and, you know, that rage when not projected out and just in alchemized in our system is key to transformation you know, in the world. It's our power um, if we're not projecting it out. Um, so yeah, there's something about this differentiating and coming into awareness and um, taking responsibility, self-responsibility, you know, in our groups. And, you know, and if we're in a group where the, the, levels, of, um, the levels of awareness around this and capacity around it um, are so different and you're finding yourself constantly in conflict and you're doing everything you can to take self-responsibility and it's still not working, then you, and, you, and the tendency is to then blame the other person because they're not um, aware enough or good enough at conflict, then maybe it's not the right group for you. You know, like I think that that for me, in any healthy relationship, um, we have to be willing to leave if we can't get our needs met there. Um, and, and so I think that just having that as a kind of option is empowering in itself and not because you're running away, not because you're like any sniff of conflict. It's like, I'm out of here. I don't want to do that work. I don't want to feel the discomfort. It's like you give it a go and you try. And, and if that doesn't, you know, bear fruit eventually, and you're just spending so much time um, stuck in this conflict, then, then maybe it's just not the right group. Um, so yeah, I'd say that this, that, that self-responsibility and, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to pause again now because it's in, in the way that I'm very good. I'm <laughs> talking a lot. So I'm going to pause, but I, I hope that we'll get the chance to come back to this kind of piece around what is it to meet our needs? Because I feel like this kind of piece around needs can get really skipped over within conversations um, about conflict. Mm. And it's interesting what, what, what you're saying <coughs> makes me kind of think, you know, you were talking about the, the kind of flip between people who you know, are, are kind of, they're coming from at some level, mm. an assumption that they're right, and then mm. the other people who are coming from an assumption mm. that they're wrong. And I think that, um, and I can absolutely see how that, that flip-flops going mm. down, diff, you know, the, the levels. Mm. Um, and I was thinking that, that self-responsibility and what are my needs are, are kind of also two sides of the same mm. coin in a way. Mm. The, the the what are my needs is you know what what you know what is what is going to make this safe what are what's are not getting met in me that I really needed to be able to stay in relationship mm. and the self responsibility is what am I bringing to this situation mm. that I mm. might not want to acknowledge but that that's mm. really not necessarily helping mm. um, so again you know I, I I imagine that some people would have a tendency to be better at going at seeing what their needs are mm. um, and maybe less skilled at seeing what their their responsibility might be yeah. and, and vice versa yeah uh, and it's not that one's necessarily better than the other they're 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 all just responses to other things that are going on inside of us well and it's a journey and i feel like you know i've been in varying various different um relationships with that you know it's like you know there's been times where i've been much more in the kind of um yeah it's easier for me to kind of be like these are my needs but it's like but unless you're in healthy relationship with your needs then that can just be a kind of demand or a you know or a sense of entitlement um and and then you know then when i have been in you know, a very deep kind of process around 
um, learning to feel my vulnerability, it's like the, the more able I've been to feel my vulnerability, the more I've connected with what um, we can call your, my core wound, um, which has a, you know, most pretty much core wound is about feeling that you've done something wrong and bad. And so um, then of course, when you're connecting with that, um, then it's very easy to believe that that it's all about res taking responsibility and self responsibility. And you know, I've been through a long period of kind of feeling like, you know, the only way that I, you know, I can be a, a good person is if I just take responsibility for everything. In kind of like a knee jerk reaction, in a way, to having realised that I previously was quite um, unaware of the impact that that how I was showing up in relationship was having on others. So then I kind of almost had a knee jerk reaction into them feeling you know, very bad and guilty and that, that I really needed to take responsibility for everything, which actually was also not that helpful. Um, but it was part of the process, I guess, that what I'm trying to bring through is that when, when we do step onto this journey um, around inner reflection and starting to feel our vulnerability um, uh, in, a, in a really um, empowered way, um, then it's a journey and we're not going to get it all right. You know, it's not going to be all kind of cozy and rosy straight away or ever perhaps you know and in a way what we're trying to kind of train ourselves to do is to get more and more comfortable with discomfort you know we're not trying to get rid of discomfort we're just trying to work our internal muscles to be okay with discomfort and that's for me that's where true power lies um, is being able to tolerate you know a strong emotion um, yeah yeah you, you were talking about the, the inner uh, being at the epicenter of mm. our being. Mm. Um, and it, you know, I, don't, I don't know how you'd like to kind of unpack that, whether that's more about a kind of personal journey or, or whether that has a kind of application in groups, whether you know, that's, that's mm. the way that we can be together. Mm. <clears throat> there are so many ways I could answer that question. Um, and all of the questions. Um, but the way that I seem to be wanting to answer it <laughs> is, um, yeah, I mean, one way of looking at this kind of uh, idea that the putting the inner back into the epicenter of life is that the reality is, is that for each of us, the only way that we experience life is through ourselves. It's like, so of course it's the epicenter and there are many of us, but the only thing that we experience is life showing up through me. So even, you know, if I'm thinking about, um, you know, more of a spiritual path and I'm thinking of connecting with spirit, it's like, yeah, but my experience of spirit can only show up through me. And similarly with soul, my experience of soul can only show up through me. My experience of you, Eva, and my relationship with you can only show up through me, for me, you know, and I could say the same for you. And so I think um, in terms of conflict, it's so important. I mean, and relationship more generally, it's like, unless we're really in touch with what happens in us, you know, and the emotions and the stories and narrative that go on, then we're just going to be projecting. You know, it's just going to be an idea of what this other person is thinking or feeling or doing, because everything goes through the filter of me. So unless I'm um, becoming more and more aware of what that filter is and what kind of um, narratives and beliefs are shaping that, that filter and therefore the judgments I'm making, then it's all projection. And, and unless I'm in touch with the feelings, then again, it's all projection. It's like, it, it, because you, you can only really, um, I can only feel empathy and compassion um, if, I, if I feel vulnerability arising in me otherwise it's just sympathy and i'm projecting poor, poor person you know it's like oh but if i'm if i'm feeling compassion arise in me i have to have a felt sense of myself so that for me that's this is what the returning the inner dimension to the epicenter is is recognizing that that the only way we can kind of um relate in a kind of conscious healthy way with anything whether that's with other human beings with the other than human world um you know it is through our relationship with ourself and the filter that, that is kind of, um, yeah, creating the, the experiences that we have and the judgments that we make and the sense that we make of the world. And of course, that filter um, 
primarily is, you know, at the kind of core is patriarchy. It's like we've all been conditioned into patriarchy and therefore the primary filter that we have for our experience is a whole bunch of beliefs and judgments around what's right and wrong. Um, what, what should get given value, what shouldn't, what's more powerful, what's not, um, what's, what belongs and what doesn't. And then on top of that filter, we've got another filter which will have come about through our, you know, the, the family home that we grew up in and then the school and then the workplace and the friends. And, you know, and it's like there, there's a number of filters, but, but patriarchy is the, the kind of core one. And so if we're not aware of that and we're not aware of how that's impacting the kind of stories that we tell ourselves, the beliefs that we have and how we experience the world, in us, then, then yeah, then it's all just playing out the same victim oppressor patriarchal system. It's interesting when you're talking, I'm, I'm having a kind of um, sort of interesting sort of sense of um, how personal what you're saying is, but also how impersonal, mm. how, how, um, mm. We kind of inhabit this this body and this experience mm. and mm. and um you know have had have had these layers of experience that have built up to give us mm. a kind of um a frame which if we're not conscious of if we don't if we don't start to try and understand um just seems like oh that's how the world is mm. um, and it's a fascinating illuminating journey to start trying to mm. understand where do you where do you think people make a start on that mm. i mean i'm sure there isn't just one place but what mm. kinds of things are, are mm. likely to spark somebody kind of going hang on a minute mm. Mm. in specific relationship to uh to starting this journey to serve us to be able to show up in conflict more healthily do you mean yeah i guess so yeah mm. I mean, I guess there's, there's, a, there's a variety of routes and I kind of almost feel like it's, it's different for everyone. And I would just, personally, I would just encourage anyone that feels kind of the sort of um, truth, you know, in this need to be self-reflecting and, um, and looking at our, our, uh, our inner worlds, um, I would say, follow your nose, you know, see what feels interesting. You know, for some that might be mindfulness. Um, you know, and there's a lot of, and a growing body of work around mindfulness and social change that's really making the connection between mindfulness and patriarchy and social change. Um, you know, maybe it's psychotherapy. Maybe you feel a nudge towards, you know, body-based psychotherapy. Um, um, you know, may, maybe it's through nature connection. Um, you know, there are all sorts of ways that we can kind of start that journey. Um, I just feel like it is different for everyone. And I, I definitely feel like um, there's something about, to, to the best degree possible, taking a kind of uh, approach to it that, that's committed to not taking it too seriously. Because I think it's so easy to get really kind of almost possessed by the kind of the ghost of conflict um, and, and inner work and relationship, you know, it's like, and let's just remember <laughs> that it's okay. It's really okay. And it can feel like our life depends on it um, because our nervous system can get you know, activated into a, a state that it genuinely feels like it's about to get eaten by a tiger. Um, but it's not, you know, and we're okay. And so there's something about in our approach to what, what we want to go to to get help to get some support around this, really follow the joy, you know, follow like what feels like it is meaningful for you, what feels like it's it, like pleasurable, you know, like what, what would actually be a bit of a blast to do. And maybe that would, that seems a bit off the map for some people <laughs> to think that doing inner work could be a blast. But in my experience it is, you know, if you can take um, a lighthearted approach and recognize that, you know, it's, it's okay. It's, you know, actually what, what is it to bring a more playful approach to this and, and a kind of, generative ap approach that's about you know um creating more health rather than kind of getting stuck in the kind of addiction to pain and difficulty um yeah and i suppose another way of answering that question is that i feel like 
for me, a really useful frame, and you and I have been talking about this in, in our work context, uh, for me, a really useful kind of reframe of conflict is rupture and repair. And I think that when we, when we include the repair bit, there's something really generative in that that kind of reminds our system, ah, oh, okay, yeah, it's about repair. It's not just about uh, horrible conflict. <laughs> it's, you know, it's about a commitment to repair. And so in terms of, you know, next steps and what people might do, it's like, oh, what is it to think about? How do I get better at kind of um, trusting myself? Trusting myself to be able to repair relationships if they get a bit sticky and difficult because this for me in my experience this has been the absolute key to me being willing um my system my nervous system being willing to show up in conflict and kind of make a mess in a way and include more of myself rather than get stuck in very narrow versions of myself um, because by focusing on the repair to begin with it's like oh yeah okay so i've by learning to feel my vulnerability and be much more present in relationship and knowing myself more so I'm not frightened of what I'm doing because I'm much more in relationship with the different parts of myself. It's like, oh, I have this trust in myself, which has not always been there, to fix relationships if they get sticky, to tell someone that I love you and I'm really sorry that I, I recognize that caused you pain or, you know, I really hear that's, that's pain for you, for you or whatever it is, but, you know, to really be able to show up pre in presence to say, I want to repair this and I care about you and I care about the relationship. Somehow for me, putting the emphasis on that repair piece is the kind of ingredient that help ingredient that helps me to feel like it's okay to kind of have the rupture and the rupture is essential, you know, like it, it's easy. It would be easy to kind of fall into a shadow of like, Oh, so we'll just focus on the repair, but actually that's just going to be a bypassing and it will just get bigger and bigger and or more and more subterranean and affect, our groups and relationships even more so for, yeah there's something about this kind of going into an inquiry around rupture and repair that feels um yeah really important mm. yeah i was thinking uh, i was also thinking about the kind of the the things that that, that flag that there's something else happening here yeah. and you know, absolutely. There, there. As many as there are people, mm. times many as there are people. Mm. <laughs> but I guess it's it's very often discomfort, isn't it? It's very mm. often, um, you know, things just not going your way, or repeatedly not going your way, mm. or, or mm. seeing that the way that you were understanding a situation is so different to the other person, mm. Um, mm. and it's it's those kind of experiences that come along. And I certainly know that my um, kind of, uh, you know, first step into psychotherapy mm -hmm. um, was, you know, in my in my marriage, where actually the the the, the choice I didn't want to. I mean, I had actually trained to do as an art therapist, but I mm -hmm. still thought of myself as somebody who didn't need therapy mm. even though I was a therapist <laughs> so it's mm. other people you know I'm here for mm. those poor other people who need therapy um but when I, when my relationship got to the point where it was worse to be in my relationship than it was to go into therapy mm. you know that was when I would go mm. and it was you know that was really at a point where where otherwise we would have broken up um, so there was a lot of really unpleasant water to be waded through mm. of, of, you know, trying to make it work and not managing that, that before I reached that point. Mm. And I think that's quite, I, I don't think that's uncommon. Mm. Um, I think it can be, you know, it can need a really strong push mm. to, um, you know, in the way that you were saying, it was really uncomfortable feedback that you mm. were getting from, mm. from people. Um, you know, di first dipping your toe in the water mm. in 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 a work is really scary, mm. and it and it feels, I guess, because it's so not socially sanctioned, it's mm. it's so countercultural, so mm. Mm. Um, that it's that it you know it, it can be, yes, it can be it can be very testing, and yet as you say, the actual journey mm. is so fascinating. Mm. Um, 
and so illuminating mm. in, in so many ways mm. it's not that it's not that it's not also painful but then life mm. is tends mm. to be painful whether mm. you go there or not mm. Um, mm. Yeah. and i think just listening to what you're saying i think um one of the things that's occurring to me which kind of returns us in a way to what we were talking about right at the beginning around this sort of those that are conditioned to think they're right and those that are conditioned to think they're wrong there's something about how um often what can happen is um when conflict is being played out through the head um through at a conceptual level then i think there's a there's a danger of um yeah, of that of power dynamics playing out through conflict. You know, it's it's depending on what the mainstream culture of a group is. It's almost like then there's a there's an there's a way that we do conflict or there's a way that we communicate, and everything else is kind of made wrong. Um, and I think often within our social environmental groups, there there can be quite a kind of intellectual heady um, approach which can really kind of exacerbate that kind of there are those that are right and there are those that keep quiet basically <laughs> um and um yeah so that for me there's something about you know if you if you identify as someone who um yeah often does feel like you're right if you identify as someone who is very bright and intelligent and and brings a lot of um potency to a group but takes up quite a lot of space you know maybe just inquiring into yourself like you know to what degree am i aware of the impact that i have on others to what degree am i aware of my feelings and like i might in a conflict or a tension a difficult conversation i i might feel really strong and a really um kind of flowing intellectual kind of grasp of what's going on but maybe just asking yourself like but what goes on in my body like what emotions am i feeling um and yeah and like it, this i guess this is just a really strong invitation that if that if any of that rings true to any of you who are listening to this it's like you know when we really zoom out um in terms of what the work that we that's brought us all to be watching this you know some connection with the transition movement there's going to be some part of us that recognizes that the the world that we're living in and the culture that's kind of dominating is causing a lot of unnecessary suffering and inequality and and actually leading to you know a question as to whether we can continue to live um on this planet as this species and so there's something about just really recognizing that this dynamic that plays out within us if we are one of those people that occupies a lot of power but without an awareness around that nothing wrong with power but if you're not aware of it and you're not conscious of your relationship with power the chances are you're really feeding into that very dynamic um, that we could call patriarchy um, or capitalism or the industrial growth model, whatever you want to call it, that, that movements like transition are really, really trying to bring about some beautiful change in response to, um, you know, unless we're self-reflecting on what role we play in that, we're just playing it out, you know, and, and so, yeah, there's something about really wanting to ask those of you that are watching this to really just ask yourself those questions of like you know when i look at the culture that i'm living in and that more and more we're seeing is is bringing into question whether we can continue you know life on this planet like you know where do i fit into that like what i project out there as being the problem that you know that whatever lens you want to see it through in relationship to power how does how do i sit in that and what can i do even if it's small to just start that journey and, you know, I don't know if I would have gone on that journey if I hadn't been kind of, you know, had the kind of midlife crisis that I had whereby everything kind of got turned upside down and I was in such a state, it was almost like I've got no choice but to look at this. I don't know. It's an interesting question that I often ask myself is that those, of, those that have got a lot of power and not very much conscious around, consciousness around it, um, do, do people ever voluntarily give up power? It feels like a really interesting question you know like is what i've gone through whereby i'm effectively really cleaning out my oppressor inner oppressor you know i'm really been coming into relationship with the part of my psyche that is an oppressor and the part that's a victim um but like do people do that voluntarily because it's not comfortable you know um but yeah 
to anyone listening and watching now, I really invite you to ask yourself that question. You know, what, what, what's your role in that oppressor victim um, um, model of power? Um, and if you do hold a lot of power, how aware are you of the impact that that has on other people? Um, and how able are you to take responsibility for that power and to really use it in a good way that supports others to be empowered too? Mm. Yeah, and likewise, I guess if you don't, you mm. know, if you tend to give up your power yeah. um, and, and give it away to, to other mm. people, whether or not they're asking for it, um, mm. there's, you know, similar questions mm -hmm. to be asked. Mm. Um, because it's you know there's there's growth in all directions mm. isn't it? yeah absolutely and I think that's a really interesting one because that so depends on the conditions of the relationship in the group and I because I think that um, again it's like you know if you take historic trauma and um, you know marginalized communities it's like it's quite a big ask to ask you know someone who's come from a very tradition you know historically marginalized community you know, someone, perhaps a person of color, you know, to say, well, I need you to just step up and da, 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 da. It's like, well, yeah, there's truth in that, but you know, let's also take responsibility for the, the eons of, you know, of oppression and injustice um, that have led to this situation. And so there is something about having an analysis of our own power and privilege. And if you are in a context where the, there's enough safety in the relationship in the, and the group, then then the invitation is to take advantage of that you know like and and if if not and you are feeling like you're part of the marginalized um culture then then that's a different thing you know so for me it's it's both it's like really checking it out for ourselves of like well how safe actually is it like you know and and if it doesn't feel safe and if you are in a group where actually you know there still is you know, you know, sort of marginalization of particular ways of being and colors of skin or whatever it is, then don't, don't, you know, mess around in that. Why put yourself through it? It's not your responsibility. Um, and if there is enough safety, you know, just checking it out for a reality check, maybe there is enough safety and maybe it is an environment that the people there have got enough self-awareness that the repair can happen. And, um, that, you know, that's a complex topic. Um, um, which we could have a whole other interview about, but um, yeah, I'd say that, yeah, it's both. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. We're kind of moving towards the end of mm. our time together. Um, I wonder if there's anything that you would like to pick up on mm. that you haven't yet. Mm. Um, you mentioned uh, kind of inner led change and what that mm. looks like. I don't know whether mm. there's anything more you want to say on that or, or anything else. Mm. I guess one thing that um, touched me um, in the conversation that we've had, it was actually a question that you asked me about what can people do, you know, like what, you know, if they're listening to this and feeling like they want to step onto this journey and don't really know where to go. And I, and I noticed a sort of a bit of a residue in my being afterwards because I didn't feel like I was really able to give an answer that felt satisfactory or something. You know, if I was listening to this, then I might feel like, well, great, but I don't really know what to do next. Um, and so, yeah, so maybe coming back to that, I feel like, you know, a, a massive reason that you and I um, initiated Starter Culture, the work that we're doing together, um, was because we saw that that was a thing that, you know, that actually so many people working within the social environmental movement um, are wanting to find support around this. And, you know, even if it's just like a tiny, tiny bit of wanting to kind of just scrape around the surface um, to get some support around conflict, it can be really hard to find that support. And unfortunately, the world that we're living in means that um, mostly you have to have the money to be able to pay for it. Um, and so, yeah, so I guess I just want to add to what I said before is, which is that the work that Eva and I are doing together, um, are, you know, really is trying to make that, that support much more accessible, both in terms of having a website that will, you know, that will really signpost people to the, the kind of, um, the abundance of support that actually is out there. It's just that it's tends to be quite hard to find it. So we want to kind of create a bit of a roadmap in a way so that people don't just feel at a loss and that they know where to go and kind of get guided through that process with choice, you know, so that you can find the, the, the way in that suits you. Um, 
but also you know part of the work that that you and i are doing is is wanting to raise awareness with funders the funding community so that you know funding for that kind of work can become more available so that it isn't down to whether you earn enough money and can afford to get therapy or get mind you know have mindfulness um sessions or whatever it's like you know we really want this um, inner work to become abundantly available because in my opinion you know it's as fundamental as it as a free education it's like you know emotional education mm -hmm. that is the key to liberation you know if if access to support around emotional intelligence was a basic human right we'd be living in a very different world yeah absolutely mm. maybe a good a good uh <laughs> to end on. Mm. Uh, yeah well thank you so much for mm. for being with us it was really really interesting mm. um and I, I guess that's us goodbye yeah. thank you so much thank you